Freedom of speech. Fundamental rights. Freedom of uh, conscience. Academic freedom. Freedom of press. And the right to listen. You're listening to So To Speak, the free speech podcast. Brought to you by FIRE, the foundation for individual rights and expression. Greetings and welcome back to another exciting edition of So To Speak, the free speech podcast, where every other week we take an uncensored look at the world of free expression through personal stories and candid conversations. I am your host, as always, Nico Perino. And if that greeting sounded familiar to you, it's because you probably recognize our guest today, Michael Moynihan, (laughs) co-host of the Fifth Column podcast, the popular Fifth Column podcast, and correspondent, right, Michael? Uh, I'm a correspondent for Vice News, yeah. Vice News Tonight. So welcome on the show. This is your first time here. It is, and thanks for having me. And, And what an intro that was. I will point out that I am not the one, those dulcet tones at the beginning of the uh, Fifth Column podcast, that's Camille Foster. Who's on her board of directors. Who's on your board of directors. So there is some overlap. It's like those shows in the 80s where they would uh, bring them together, uh, different strokes and facts of life or something. We are coming together as two uh, very important organizations. Uh, Yours slightly more than ours. (laughs) I'm not sure about that. You guys have the Fifth Column (laughs) podcast, for those who aren't familiar with it, it's a... uh, Wait, what is it? What does Camille say? Is like it's a semi regular, almost regular weekly yeah, assault a, on the news cycle and the people who make it, and occasionally ourselves. Yeah, um, very occasionally because we're we're mostly right and the uh, people in the media are mostly <laughs> wrong. So, but you know, we like to pretend that we're ecumenical and we attack ourselves. So, <laughs> well, rep it, rep in the fifth column with that t shirt now. Now that you guys, are um, yeah. So you can if you come over and subscribe to to the. Uh, podcast over at Substack. I'll, I'll send you one. Come on, just, just send me a note. I'll send you one. Yeah. But, uh, but yeah, no, and we do so much of the stuff. Um, the overlap in, in all seriousness is the free speech stuff is something that um, I think kind of brought Camille and Matt Welch from Reason and I together in a lot of ways. I mean, that's the one thing that I would say that we all agree on without any um, kind of, you know, little schismatic things that you get in you know, libertarian politics. I mean, I'm not really a libertarian. I mean, that's kind of the funny thing. Camille is not really a libertarian either. We're kind of on the fringes of that, which is maybe sometimes a little too fringe for us. But, uh, but yeah, no, the free speech issue has, has been something that's motivated me for a very, very long time. It's been the one common dominant issue in my life. Well, you guys were talking with, uh, I think it was Laura Bazelon you had on the yeah. podcast a couple of months ago. And-, and we're going to have her on again, I think this week. We recorded something with her in San Francisco. Um, oh, nice. We were out there doing an event at Substack and Laura's based in San Francisco. So we had her on and and our politics couldn't be more different, but we absolutely 100% agree on the speech issue and she's phenomenal. I love it. Yeah, that. she wrote a critique of the ACLU, which I think prompted you guys to have her yeah, on your right. podcast. Right. And there was a that's moment right. there in that podcast where uh, Matt Welch said something to the effect of, well, if the ACLU is dropping the ball, what organization should take over for their free speech work and why is it fire? And I'm like, yeah. this is like, this is like a week before we announced our expansion. And I'm like, what does Matt Welch know that we, yeah. that we don't know? And uh, yeah, I love those kind of loaded Soviet questions. And why is answer fire? So please answer for us. <laughs> yeah, it was, yeah. We were strong proponents of uh, fire taking on the cases that the ACLU not only drops but refuses to even acknowledge or take on these days i mean look if you want to have an organization that has an incredible storied um 50 plus i think your history and you want to change focus fine but um make sure that there's somebody else to pick up that that stuff and so um as before we started recording i said i'm very happy that you guys have done that that's great yeah and laura actually spoke at our we have a annual summer student conference she spoke there along with david latt so and she was fantastic. Um, I wasn't able to attend because I was in London or traveling to London or something like that. But I heard she got like a standing ovation. It was absolutely fantastic. Yeah, and so, as I say to her all the time, um, and I said to her, you know, I should say she's a professor out in California. Yeah, University. <laughs> For those of San who don't Francisco know who we're talking about, law school. Yeah, I think yeah. so. Yeah, and, and of the Bazelon family, um, uh, her sister Emily Bazelon um, got a lot of crap for writing something in the New York Times about about the trans issue in a very um, kind of balanced and interesting way. And her grandfather, and this is really interesting because um, speaking of speech issues, I mean, it's in the blood of the Bazelon family, apparently, is that I came across a case um, that I think is mentioned in Jamie Kirchick's uh, new book on his history of gay Washington, but uh, somebody from NASA who was run out of NASA for 
um, in arrest for solicitation or something like that, for basically for being gay, and um, was somebody incredibly brave in, I think, the mid-1960s who decided to challenge it. And so I don't care. I'm going to, you know, you're not going to sort of blackmail me into silence and it ruined his life. And he challenged it. And the judge that um, um, ruled in his favor was Laura Bazelon's grandfather. So it is an amazing um, history of this family who has been <laughs> has been fighting uh, for civil liberties for, for a very long time. So. Well, I think it was her sister, Emily, who wrote a book about bullying, maybe back in like 2010, 2011, 2012. And uh, we had some engagement with her uh, and I think directly, but also on paper about, because it, it's hard to forget. It's, it's, it's hard to remember at this point, like, because the free speech story has taken so many twists and turns in the last yeah, decade. But yeah. in the early part of the 2010s, bullying was kind of the way in which the Trojan horse, I guess, in which speech codes would get smuggled into That's all right. sorts of That's different right. environments, mostly schools. Um, and Emily had written, I, I think, one of the best books on that topic taken in all considerations. So that when I, when I first heard Laura, I hadn't been familiar with her work. Yeah, yeah, I yeah. thought of Emily for some reason. Um, but yeah, she's fantastic. Anyway, that's not why we're here today. Uh, Michael. No, but it does feed directly into, um, this issue, particularly when, um, you know, not to steal your, your hosting, uh, I'd say we're talking about someone rushed you, but, but, um, you know, I have been, you know, when you asked me to do this, it's not as if I had to redirect my reading or anything, because I'm always kind of reading about this. And, you know, I've known Salman for um, probably 15 years or something and um, keeping up with uh, people who were there with him and, and Buffalo and his condition and the rest of it. And it has forced me to go back and, and look at a lot of this stuff. And, and I would uh, advise your listeners if they can find this. And I th I'm pretty sure it's on YouTube. Is that uh, Kanan Malik, who I'm sure you know, who wrote a book uh, called From Fatwa to Jihad. He is a British uh, Muslim. I think he's from a Muslim background and wrote a fantastic book at the, about this, but BBC very wisely had him on Newsnight, uh, their kind of flagship news program uh, last week. And it's funny because he actually gave voice to, with a lot more authority and gravitas than I could, um, what I was thinking about the kind of, you know, you know year on year, effect that um, this kind of thing and this, the, the fatwa, starting with the fatwa really in 1989, has had on free speech. And he said that he was talking to a friend and somebody who's a friend of Salman Rushdie's and who's a novelist too, and said, um, could this novel be published, the Satanic Verses, could it be published today? And not only was his, his answer no, it was, it wouldn't be written today. Because, you know, it wouldn't get to that process through sensitivity readers. I literally was with a, an, an, an author, a very funny uh, guy who, and I was with him and his husband is a, um, someone in the fashion industry, and he's writing a book about a musician. And he said that there was a word in it that all, he had four sensitivity readers that came back and said, we object to this word. And he's, you know, an older gay man is under, understands, you know, language and it can be, you know, hurtful and offensive and the rest of it. But he's not one of those people that says, let's censor this stuff. But he looked at me and he's like, four people. He's written, you know, half a dozen books. He said, this is entirely new to me. So in the publishing industry now, and I think Kanan Malik had actually pointed something out that, that is, that is being overlooked because it is kind of a hypothetical, um, but let's play it out. Do you believe that Satanic Verses could be, could be published today? And I think the answer is, I agree with him, is absolutely not. And, um, you know, we see this in the past, and it reminded me of this uh, book that was published in, I think, 2008. Random has canceled it. And I believe it was called, and this is the top of my head here, so um, forgive me, I think it was called The Jewel of Medina. And it was, pub it was, a, it was a novel and it was canceled by Random House because uh, it was soon after the Muhammad cartoon affair. So everyone's very sensitive to this stuff. And then it was published by an independent publisher in the UK who's very um, much a free speech advocate. And their uh, headquarters, totally forgotten about, by the way. No one, I guarantee you that none of your listeners will remember this. And I'm sure all of them are very smart on this issue. In 2008, their, their headquarters were firebombed in the UK. And, you know, and look, and I wrote something I had, I, I will just say, I won't mention the people, but I'll say there was something that, that um, I had written and was involved in. And um, the person I was writing it for said, no, we, we don't want to publish this uh, because not because we're afraid of getting offense, 
But, and this is what happened in the, in the initial rush to affair in, in 1989 was that we're afraid for our employees. We don't want to put our employees and that's, you know, how it goes. It's like on you guys at fire know this very well when there is somebody who's going to potentially give an incendiary speech on campus, it is banned, not on free speech grounds. No, 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 no. It's because of safety. And that was, I had something kind of pulled for that. And then I mentioned on the podcast um, that we put up two days ago, which is for subscribers only. So you should subscribe people um, in which I said, I'm going to publish something on the, our Substack that I came across about Salman Rushdie that I wrote in 2012 because uh, the Daily Beast wouldn't publish it um, because it came with some video um, of a film that was made about Salman Rushdie um, in Pakistan. And it was a very deeply um, hideous and offensive film about how you should kill Salman Rushdie. Now, what they were afraid of was just, you know, anything. Let's just be safe and like not do this and not publish it. And the, the point of the piece that I wrote and not to be incredibly discursive about all this stuff and go from one place to another, but there's a lot to be said, is that Salman is heroic in a million ways. Um, you can disagree with his politics, as I do in a lot of cases. I don't even know what his politics are. I mean, he's I, a, I, he's, I also really don't care, but yeah. yeah I, don't care. I don't care either. He's a, he's a, you know, a, a pretty left-wing guy. Um, I think he's right about a lot of stuff and wrong about a lot of stuff, but who cares? Um, you can not love magical realism. You cannot like his novels. It doesn't make a difference. You don't. Yeah, I, I don't. I tried reading Midnight Children and I, I was like, I, I also don't like Wes Anderson because it's sort of surreal and magical. And I was like, and when yeah, I re started right. reading Midnight Children, I'm like, this is this that's is like right. the Wes Anderson written form. So I couldn't do it. Yeah, I, mean, I mean, like I, I read like Saul Bellow novels. I mean, it's a slightly different uh, <laughs> speed, you know, um, but Rushdie, when this thing came out and I mentioned on the podcast the other day, it was a film called International Gorillas. And it was a three-hour dramatic film in which the evil character is Salman Rushdie um, and this in, this band of international people get together to kill him. And uh, they succeed. Was this the thing he... So Salman spoke at our 20th anniversary gala. Was this the movie that he was talking about then? Do you remember his speech at all? I was there, actually. And I do. And I'm not remember... I don't remember if he mentioned this, probably. But the British authorities banned it because they have a very heavy hand on censorship and, um, you know, they famously banned reservoir dogs and things like that. Mm. Although and, they like uh, to say that they don't, but yes, they, they like to say that they don't, but they do. I mean, you, it's not only that you can just get arrested for tweets. It's like, you know, they will ban films. And, um, someone stepped in, uh, to say this film should be aired and shown. Um, and that was Salman Rushdie and Salman Rushdie was the man who was the uh, subject of the film and the, heroic end of the film is when Salman Rushdie uh, is murdered and that it, he stepped in and said, you can't ban this film. And of course it flopped. Um, and we made, we had this joke in the podcast. It's like, I mean, what was the expectation that this was going to be like Jurassic Park, but it was very popular in Pakistan. Well, you would have gotten the Streisand effect, right? So it probably would have flopped either way, but more people saw it probably because yeah. the British authorities yeah. had banned it. But what does that say about I mean, what does that say about someone's courage and uh, sense of a free society that there's an actual movie calling for their execution and, and the British authorities who had paid for nine years to have uh, have him protected uh, try and ban it, you know, almost like doing a service to him? Um, yeah. No, I mean, but then he says he's, no. He's man, no. Uh, uh, yeah, he's a man of unparalleled courage. Um, and, you know, somebody who really, really believes. I mean, when Zafar, his son, um, said from his hospital room, I think he was interviewed by somebody. Um, and I don't think anyone pointed out that he was, he was paraphrasing his father. And he said, you know, a free speech is the whole thing, which I've always loved the, the kind of concise nature of that sentence, because you know what he means. It's the whole it's ball a, game. It's the whole I think thing. he said in a Columbia it's the whole ball and, game. Yeah. Yeah. And like, if that's it, there's, you know, there's nothing else, if not that. And so, you know, someone's always believed that and he's lived like that. And, you know, I had asked him a long time ago, the sensitive question, I you know, I mentioned this the other day that we were having dinner and he left. Um, my friend and I were having dinner with him and we stayed on, had drinks and he was getting an Uber. And I said, do you ever you know, worry about that in the sense that, you know, it's not being stereotypical. It's not being racist. It's not, but most of the Uber drivers are non-white. You'd be very surprised when you find a white Uber driver in New York. And a lot of them are Muslim. 
And you can tell that not even from conversation with people, there's obviously, there's always a lot of like, you know, Muslim adornments on the car and the rest of it. And when you have conversations with people, is that ever an issue? I mean, you know, you're picking up, it says on your app now, you don't have to do a double take and say, is that the guy? It says, you know, you're driving towards picking up Salman and he gets in your car and he said, no, I don't, you know, it doesn't, it's it, it effectively said it's over. Um, you know, it's still a thing, but I don't have protection. And, you know, he gets, and I remember there was one uh, person who interviewed him not long ago and he mentioned it and he said, you know what, that old shit, I don't want to talk about that. You know, it's fine. I'm, I'm, I'm good. And then however many years later, um, uh, upstate New York, uh, some psychopathic Islamist from New Jersey, who I don't even believe was alive when the Satanic Verses came out. Yeah. Uh, 24 year olds. 24 years old and stabs yeah. him between 10 and 15 times. Um, I thought he would be, he would die. I mean, when I you hear, when you hear that he someone's was. getting stabbed in the neck and that they were repeatedly stabbed and yeah. it took a few moments for someone to come and help him, yeah. I thought, you know, we were, we were kind of game planning what we were doing. We were writing and it's like, how much do we write when yeah. we're just going to have to turn around and rework it if he actually does pass? So it's, <laughs> yeah. I mean, oh, no, I mean, there were, we have, um, um, you know, many, many mutual friends and people within his universe, family, orbit, whatever. Um, and there was, um, you know, the conversation right after was uh, one person in particular who um, knew more than I did too was in communication with, with um, you know, people at the, at the hospital and said, do you think he's going to die? And it was one of those questions that knowing that I didn't have any knowledge of it, was just kind of this searching question of like, you know, what do, what ha- do you think he's going to die? What happens now? And, you know, somebody who had, had, had survived for so long and then, you know, you let your guard down uh, for a while or for a minute and uh, this happens. And, you know, it's, it's funny when the, 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 I guess, statement, I guess it was, a, maybe it was um, Andrew Wiley, his agent, who said these are um, life altering injuries and I think that the kind of parenthetical was there is if he survives. And now it, we, it seems that we know that he's going to, which is. Well, well, Andrew Wiley's fantastic. statement, he, he said, you know, these are, you know, the situation is grim. Yeah. He's got a severed nerve in his arm, liver damage. He was yeah. stabbed in yeah. the neck. He's, you know, he's not vocal, although it sounds like he's vocal now. He's now and, I, yeah. and, I, and I have yeah. to admit when I heard that and he said, these, these are, um, you know, these are serious injuries. I actually had a sense of relief because it came through in a statement that he wasn't going to die. Yes, um, that's, that's right. That's right. Um, and I was like, oh, well, le- you know, at least yeah. he has life, le- you know, so it was. Um, yeah, no, I got the, the message from him um, was forwarded to me uh, soon after it came. And, you know, the first two sentences were awful. And I have in front of me here because it said, dear friends, the news is not good. Salman will likely lose one eye. Uh, the nerves in his arm were severed and his liver, his liver was stabbed and damaged. Um, you know, and uh, still nobody has any real clarity. Well, what's uh, going to happen? What's going to happen now? I mean, know. so right after the fatwa was issued in what was it, 1989, uh, Margaret Thatcher and the British government gave him a state sponsored protection. Does the United States do that now? I mean, is that something we do in the United States? Uh, it isn't really, you know. I mean, you think of it like, you know, um, when Ayan Hirsi Ali had uh, state protection from the Netherlands, she moved to America when she took her little sinecure at the American Enterprise Institute. And I met her soon after that, and she was surrounded by people that were privately, um, you know, the people that would would donate money to fire were donating money for her security. So that was, you know, the United States was not, I mean, she's obviously was not a U.S. citizen at the time. I believe she is now. Um, and it's not, you know, their responsibility. But yeah, I don't know what will happen. And I, I, I certainly know that those of us who love and respect Salman and um, think he's done more for the cause of free speech than, than anybody um, of his generation or that I can think of. I mean, just at personally, not even like, you know, somebody, there's people that fight legal battles and do stuff like that, all the very, very important stuff. But personally, you know, being that person that's, you know, storming the ramparts and saying, you know, I'll, I'll take this. Let, well, unequiv- let me, let me unequivocally this. and unapologetically, here's the reason I like Salman Rushdie, because it's fashionable today. And uh, Graham Wood had a great piece about this in the Atlantic. Too. He did in the Atlantic. By the way, the only piece in the Atlantic I, on the homepage for the ne- from the week after that. There's only one about Salman Rushdie. I mean, I know uh, Jeff Goldberg it, it knows Salman Rushdie. I know he's friends with him. I've seen Jeff Goldberg multiple years in a row at the Hitchens Award in um, in uh, this year in um, 
in uh, New York, and I just thought it would get a little more attention from them. And that actually distressed me that it really hasn't gotten a ton of attention. I, it, it has gotten, that's, that's wrong. I will say this, it, it sh- I think it should have gotten more attention. Well, at least in the Atlantic, right? A, a, yeah, a, yeah, a, yeah. A magazine of ideas. I would say when it happened, it was headline news in the New York Times. I was actually using them for, they did one of their real-time updates things. Yeah, yeah, so yeah. Just that, refresh that, yeah. it and see, what's, exactly. see yeah. what was going on. Uh, but getting back to why I like Salman Rushdie, uh, you know, and, and it's Graham Wood's piece kind of explains this. He says there's a big in, fat, crowd right now where it's fashionable to say, you know, I believe in free speech to be sure, but, and Salman Rushdie ha- talks about this all the time in his the speeches. He's like, yeah. yeah, it's the butt brigade. You know, <laughs> yeah. the, we like to call it butt heads, you know, here yeah, at yeah. fire. It's like, yeah. I believe in yeah. free speech, but, <laughs> but it's fashionable. Um, and this is one of the free reasons that fire never provides commentary on the speech that we're defending, except to say this is protected and here is why. Like, yes. we don't say this is offensive or this is this is abhorrent or, you know, it, it doesn't matter if you're a free speech And it could very right. well be both and, offensive and abhorrent, but it needs it to be very protected. Well could. Yeah, of course. Um, but right now, it, there's a lot of throat clearing among yeah. free speech advocates before you actually get to the defense of free speech. And that's one of our, the ways we're branding our expansion to say, we're not going to do any of that. We're unapologetic. Yeah, yeah, free speech yeah. is a human right. It allows for progress, peace, scientific advances. It allows us to be who we are and to speak our minds. And Salman Rushdie has, has always understood that when PEN America was going to give uh, or did give an award to um, Charlie Hebdo. And there yeah. was that um, cohort of cowards who who criticized that he called them pussies, right? He didn't yes, even swear. Yes. Um, I was in contact with him during that because I wrote a piece. Um, there was probably a piece that, that I wrote for the daily beast that, that had, you know, as a writer, you don't expect your pieces, especially now when there's so much out there of having any impact. And that had a little bit of impact. And, you know, there was actually somebody who signed that letter against Charlie Hebdo, who I think said in the guardian that they had read my piece and then taken their name off of it and said, actually, I think I misunderstood it. And I had been talking to him and a former, um, for, a former president of Penn about this in real time and, you know, talking to him about, you know, losing friends anew. Um, it didn't happen as much in the, in the past because if you want to look at the Atlantic, here's a good thing to look up at the Atlantic, 1989 or 90. It might have been even 90. I think it was 89. But I found it on their website and there's a PDF of it if you want to find it that, that the international – it was the International Rushdie Defense Committee, I think it was called, um, it took out an ad in a bunch of you know literary journals, newspapers, et cetera. And in that in that ad, they they um, just had a bunch of people sign their names, say like you know we support Salman's right to free speech. The list of people is amazingly impressive. I mean, left, right, center. I mean, good God. I mean, Noam, Noam Chomsky's on it. Um, uh, you know, John Pilger, not John Pilger. No, he's tar- terrible. He's, he's, um, I was thinking, <laughs> I don't even know who that is. <laughs> so well, he's just, he, you don't want to know who he is. Um, uh, what's his name? The, uh, the Harold Pinter, uh, Harold Pinter's wife, Anthony Frazier, everybody under the sun signed that thing. And I'm thinking about what would happen today. And then in light of what happened, the signing of a letter in when it came to the Charlie Hebdo stuff was people opposing it. I know. And not only were people opposing, you know, oh, these guys shouldn't get it because they had, the staff had just been murdered during an editorial meeting. I mean, is there any more kind of salient time to come out and support people in their free speech and their right to offend and not be murdered uh, than to say, well, actually, you know, they were doing X and Y. And that is the victory of 1989 in the fatwa. We've internalized the fatwa in a way that that idea that, you know, in a, that, look, the book wasn't banned in Iran. You could find copies of the book in Iran. The, the book was reviewed in Iranian state newspapers, right? The fatwa came from, from the Ayatollah and, you know, was continued and continued for, for a number of years since. It was only in places like the UK where W.H. Smith, if anyone's been to England, they know W.H. Smith, which is like, you know, you get off the plane and that's where you buy the copy of The Guardian, The Telegraph and everything. They refused to carry the book because, of course, they were afraid of what was going to happen to their employees. This is right soon thereafter. Indian uh, Penguin, which had just opened in India, uh, Penguin had just opened an outpost in India, uh, refused to publish the book, period. And Salman Rushdie was informed of that during an interview with somebody from the Indian press. And they said, oh, by the way, how do you feel 
about Penguin, your publisher, refu- refusing to publish your book in India. Now, keeping in mind, in India, this was a very political thing. Uh-huh. There was a, a moment, there was an election coming up. It was two, two months out. And, you know, a, a sort of Islamist uh, inflected party wanted to make an issue and they did a very good job of it. Um, you know, there was, uh, you know, conversations about whether or not they would publish the paperback copy of it. I mean, this is like, it, it wasn't as if Salman stood athwart violence yelling, fuck you. And that was it up until last week. No, no, everybody around crumbled. Everybody around the Muhammad cartoon crisis crumbled. Who published them in America? Almost nobody. The New well, York it, Sun, I believe, is I, one. Was Philadelphia Inquirer the opinion they, page they, one? Yes, they did. But they didn't publish the quote unquote offensive ones. So there were ones that were actually, um, uh, that were submitted to Yelan's Post and, and Fleming Rose that were making fun of Fleming Rose. Mm-hmm. There was like, you know, a, a cartoon of him sort of like saying, yeah. oh, look at, we're being challenging. And look, it, you know, in fairness to Fleming, they published those too, right? They would publish anything. Yeah. Uh, so it, it, the actual Muhammad bomb in the turban that was um, uh, drawn by a very famous Danish cartoonist named Kurt Vestergaard, uh, who died um, fairly recently. And remember, by the way, this is how important the free speech struggle is. Vestergaard died a natural death because he was in his late 80s, but he was almost murdered in his own house mm-hmm. and had to run into a panic room which the Danish pet, the special uh, secret police or the um, uh, security police had installed, press a button. And there's a man, uh, I think he was a Somali immigrant or something, was a man wielding a sword. Um, and guess what was outside in the living room while he was stuck in there? His grandson was sitting on the couch watching uh, cartoons. And the D- Danish police were there immediately. Yeah. The guy came outside and they shot him. Um, I think he survived, but... Kurt Vestergaard, you know, there's another guy in Denmark who defended, uh, a bit of a crazy person, but who cares, defended um, the right of the publication of those cartoons. And a mailman came to his door in the Danish, you know, sort of mailman's outfit, rang the doorbell and he opened the doorbell and he got shot. Uh, It was not a mailman, obviously. I mean, this is, these are things that are totally forgotten about. Yeah. I mean, the body count on offensive uh, Islam uh, Mm -hmm. is high. I mean, all you have to do is look at Charlie Hebdo. The Japanese five, trans, yeah, the, Japanese translator, uh, of, Italian, yeah, Norwegian, the satanic yeah. verses. I mean, the, yeah. the body count is unfortunately high. And in, in Turkey, there was a riot, a riot yeah. um, surrounding the publication of the satanic verse. What you know? And I have to admit, I haven't actually read the satanic verses. As I said, I, Rushdie's writing isn't style. for me. <laughs> yeah, it's not. It's not really for me. I don't actually know what in it offended people. I think it was the treatment of the Prophet Muhammad that it was seen as divisive. I don't really Speaking care. Speaking of the Streisand effect, amazingly, probably one of the best-selling books that was the least read book um, after it was purchased, I'm sure. And, and definitely not read by the people who... Uh, oh, <laughs> who yes, uh, they admitted that. Yeah, yeah. The yeah people but it's, I think it it's it was at the top of the Amazon charts or somewhere close to it. Uh, this after, week, yeah. yeah after yeah. Um, yeah. the attempt on, on Salmon's right life. But I, I will say, coming back to the Muhammad cartoons, Yale University Press published a book on the history of that controversy and in publishing that book, refused to actually print the cartoons. Yeah, it was Karsten Yusta, kind of Karsten Yusta, something like that. Yeah, they refused to publish the cartoons. And they also, there was also another um, book that I think that they wouldn't publish or shied away from. And um, I, I think that actually happened to Fleming too, Fleming Rose, in his memoir. Tyranny um, of Silence? It's amazing. Yeah, oh, it's it, a fantastic book. It's there a fantastic are, book. There are, like, there are a couple of books in the past three decades that really adds something new to the free speech conversation. And actually, uh, Jonathan Rausch's Kindly Inquisitors, which was written One of in best. response to the yes. Salman Rushdie affair, I think Brilliant is probably book. the best yeah. philosophical yeah. defense of, of freedom of speech written in the past half century. And then there's, of course, Tyranny of Silence. And Yakamu Shigama wrote, I think, the definitive history of free speech Another, recently. another Dane. Yeah, know? another Dane. There's, there's, yeah, some, there's someone something going on there. Flemings, yeah. 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 And I met, I met Jakob in Denmark. Um, years ago when I was living in Sweden and I used to see him in, in Denmark and this group of people that were um, always standing out there uh, defending free speech and Jakob being one of them. And, you know, I mean, the, the Fleming's book, which was published by Cato's Press, you would think that, you know, such a world altering event, and, it, and that's not an understatement, people would want to publish his account of it, and he was in conversation with those people, but he did actually say that the cartoons have to be published as a part of it. And, you know, they were published, I think, in the Cato book, I'm pretty sure, and nothing happened because no one ever pays attention to these things until 
they are, there's somebody, you know, look, I mean, I'll tell you a very quick story. This is somebody that I think is um, a real hero and completely ignored and nobody knows anything about him. He started out from the opposite of a hero, being a, a, a repugnant person who was a kind of self-appointed imam in um, Denmark. And he and another imam uh, decided to create the entire cartoon affair. It, it had a little bit of, uh, you know, a little bit of news in, in, in Denmark. And they took these cartoons and then added cartoons that were not in the, the, the paper. One that was Muhammad as a pig, which actually was not, it was, a, it was an image that was taken from like a, you know, some sort of uh, like bacon festival or something in, in France of a guy with a pig nose on. And they printed these out and they brought them on this tour of the Middle East. By the end of this tour, there were riots. There were enormous numbers of deaths. I mean, keep this in mind. I mean, the deaths that, you know, I think it's in a way, you know, quite racist that we don't pay attention to the deaths of the people in these countries that are rioting and are being killed by the police. I mean, five people were killed in the first week, I think, or second week after the Satanic Versus Affair in Pakistan, because there was uh, riots in Pakistan while people were mar marching very ironically, <laughs> weirdly, because it's just their instinct to march, march to the American Cultural Center. Like he's British, yeah. it's published in the UK. <laughs> and it's you know, close enough, he's all fucking infidels. And five people were killed by the security police. Is that police there? This happened in Africa and various places in response to the to the um the Yulans Postum cartoons. But this one guy had been a part of this and he came back to Denmark. And the security police in Denmark, Pep, said, You know, you're really hated here. If I were you, I'd be careful. And they're not being this in a nasty way. They're actually, they protect everybody. And they're saying, I would, you didn't break a law. I would be very careful. So what he does is he goes to Greenland. And he goes to Greenland, which is, you know, a Danish kind of protectorate, and um, ends up living there in isolation and kind of fear. And while he's there, he does something which is, is by the way, this guy's name is Ahmed Akari. And he's there, and Akari goes to, to the library. There's nothing to do. And he's not even a nook, the kind of, you know, the, the, the town the size of, uh, you know, Godness, some tiny place in Long Island or something. And he's in the middle of nowhere and he goes to the library and he starts reading. And this is really an amazing, amazing story because it shows you that good ideas can defeat bad ones. And he starts reading and seeing like, man, this stuff is amazing. I called him at a certain point during this. I was tipped off to him. I wrote a piece about it ages ago. And he's saying, Michael, have you heard of this guy and that guy? And I'm like, yeah, yeah, no, I heard about that stuff when I was in high school. <laughs> have you heard about this and that? And I'm like, yeah, no, that was in college. And he came back to Denmark and he went to the house. Um, this was arranged, obviously, beforehand um, to Kurt Vestergaard, who drew the Muhammad of the Bomb in the cartoon, publicly hugged him, apologized to him, apologized to the country of Denmark and said, I'm going to devote my life to exactly the opposite of what I de devoted it to before. Which is, which is free speech and realizing that I was the problem and I'm sorry. And it is remarkable. Abu Laban was the other uh, imam. He died um, and never had a change of heart, of course. But Ahmed Akari is a great example of somebody who was an instigator of this sort of stuff. And then because of his interactions with the psychopaths who wanted everybody dead, you know, I mean, the number of people who were shot and stabbed and et cetera, you know, Lars Vilks, uh, all these people in, in, in Denmark and Sweden and stuff. And he said, this is madness. This is madness. And then, you know, when I was talking to him, the final point on this, but it is an important story, actually. Is he still, he's still alive? He's still alive. Yeah. A friend of mine ghost wrote his memoir, um, which I uh, wrote it with him. Um, I wouldn't say ghost wrote it, but um, uh, who's a friend of Jakob's, actually. They're, they're all in a small country, all in the same uh -huh. circle. Jakob's now uh, a fellow at FIRE as well. He wrote a piece on Salman that was published in New York Daily News, too. Yes, I saw it. And people should read that. I mean, Jakob's one of the, the smartest men on this subject um, on God's green earth. Um, you know, so, so this, you know, he comes back and, and, and does all this stuff. And I'm talking to him. And I said, you understand, you realize, and I think you just heard about it, a video had come from Syria. A lot of Danish uh, Islamists had gone and fought in Syria, a lot of people in Europe. And this is full kind of 2000, I guess, what, I don't know, 13, full 14? Are you talking about the innocence of Muslims? Muslim? No, this is, oh, okay. this is um, after this. And so there's, there's a, a, a Danish jihadist division in um, Syria. 
and they're speaking to camera. You know, they're releasing all these videos all the time. They're speaking to camera and speaking in this very heavily accented Danish. And um, they say, you know, Allah does punishes the non-believers, all this nonsense. And they turn around, they swing around, and they all have their Kalashnikovs, and they open fire. They start shooting. And there are pictures on a berm, and uh, they're shooting these photographs. And one of them is Ahmed Akari. And these are the people that are going to be killed. You know, Fle Fleming Rose is one of them. You know, a couple of other people, Ahmed Akari is in there. I said, you know, Ahmed, you just chose a very different path in your life. Um, and it's going to be rather different. And I imagine people like Ahmed now who have had a, you know, a, a period of relative calm um, after the, you know, initial tumult uh, are probably rethinking that now after what happened to Salma. Yeah. And they would be right to. I remember these I, people don't forget. No, they don't. And I, re, I remember going to an event with uh, Fleming Rose. I think this was 2015. It was Wellesley College. And he still had security. I remember like these two. I was there. Tall, yeah. I, were you there? Yeah, you yes, were there. That's so funny. Yes. That's so funny because I met him that evening in Wellesley at a, at a, um, I think Yelkup was there too, at a Thai restaurant. And there was nobody in the Thai restaurant. We sat in the back, way in the back. You know, nobody there except for two people up the front that looked like they were in fucking, you know, uh, uh, MMA fighters. And there were these two Danish guys. And he's like, that's my security. Yeah. But <laughs> Salman, like, do you guys want anything? And they're like, they just looked at me and they said, no. Yeah. I just don't talk to you. Yeah. But Salman, he, did, he didn't have security. I mean, when he no, came to our event, he, he not only didn't have security, he said he didn't want it. Um, yeah. He had, yeah. he had very much lived his life um, yeah. saying, I can't, yeah. I can't have the shadow around me anymore. But now, yeah. you know. And that's what his memoir is a lot about that. I mean, Joseph Anton, which, yeah, which I reviewed for the Wall Street Journal when it came out, uh, which is a great book. Um, a lot I'm, not sure about it's in, I'm not sure it's in print anymore. I mean, I'm sure they're changing that because when I, I hadn't read it, I have to admit, and I, I feel bad saying I haven't read some, uh, uh, Satanic Verses or Joseph Anton, which is- This one is definitely more your speed, yeah. 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 Uh, so I, I downloaded it on Audible and Kindle, but I tried to get it in print because I wanted to do a podcast about it, and it's always helpful to highlight while I'm- But I couldn't yeah, find yeah, it sure. unless you want to do- um, you wanted to buy it secondhand, so that needs to change. Obviously, really, I, and I could be wrong. Amazing. This is just Am this is just Amazon, right? And I, you know, yeah, it yeah, it, yeah. I'm it, sure you can find a used copy, but but the point being that, yeah, it should, we, one would imagine it would still be in print because most you know, of his it other is a great books are. Book. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, no kidding. Yeah. So, um, but I, I do want to say this about publishing, right? Uh, it's a First Amendment protected activity, you know, yeah. like news journalism. You would think that the people who work in there uh, would take free speech seriously. And you would probably know this better than I would, Michael, but I recall hearing that after the fatwa was issued and there was concerns about publishing the book, concerns for staff, right? Like, do you want to get your security guard and your uh, secretary firebombed? Uh, I can understand those calculations, but yeah, I do too. My, my, my understanding is that the publishers banded together and dis dispersed the publishing of the book. So it would be, the responsibility would lie on a bunch of different publishers and not just... Yeah. One. Yes, the I am Spartacus way of doing it. Yeah, yeah, the I am Spartacus way of doing it. Um, and you know, the the sensitivity readers is a new phenomenon uh, that I don't think many of us have experienced before. And it just goes to show, and it says something about the publishing industry that would they do that today, right? Um, if they wouldn't publish satanic verses, as the argument goes, um, because they couldn't get past sensitivity readers, or Salman wouldn't even write it. Um, you know, would they go that extra step of putting their staff at risk to publish a work of art? Um, it, it is the unfortunate way I think people look at this is a black and white way, because what they do is they say things like, well, they wouldn't publish it, but somebody would, um, which is not a, a huge consolation to me, because it, it ignores the fact that this stuff has had an effect, like had a very... A significant effect. I mean, sensitivity readers, like uh, who cares? You know, it's not, they're not being, they're not being censored. They're just, you know, having, making suggestions. Well, first of all, it's like the suggestion of the mafia. You know, this, the mafia comes and says, I suggest that you pay protection money. You better pay it. It's not, you know, something that you kind of voluntarily do. But when you allow that stuff to happen for so long, you basically set the kind of intellectual framework. And I think that that's ultimately the problem is that the intellectual framework now, especially amongst young people, and I talk to younger people about this all the time, um, this is definitely not an ideological thing. I mean, number of people on the left that support free speech and support Salman and would support publishing that book who are over the age of like 45, I think is very, very different than the ones under the age of 45. It's, it's, it's definitely generational more than it is ideological. But when you ch have that change in culture, 
when you say like, oh, our parents used to believe as that used to be totally normal. You know, you did, you drove kids without seatbelts and things like this is like the times change, the ideas and the sensitivities in the kind of direction of the kind of intellectual debate changes. And when you do that incrementally, I think it does actually change in huge ways, right? I mean, so you, you have these things like, what's the big deal about X or Y? People aren't being prevented from publishing. There's all sorts of opportunities out there. But when major mainstream publishing companies, and there's a consolidation of those that, you know, Bertelsmann, you know, owning almost everything now, and these these new, I mean, what is it, Random House or HarperCollins? Or, I think it's Random House. That, yeah, one of Penguin, the big fives like, merged, right? like, They're coming down to like the big three. And, <laughs> and when those people actually control um, you know, what gets published and what is acceptable to publish. Because then you get to the thing like W.H. Smith's. Then you get to the thing about, are you going to stock it? Are you going to have the paperback? Um, because you can, I mean, look, the, the hero, I mean, all these little small, tiny heroes of the Rushdie affair. One was a guy who owned a, book, a bookstore in Berkeley who refused to, to buckle to this stuff and had Salman um, come and speak when people were not doing so. I think it was in 1990. Um, and it was, I think, uh, Firebomb too. And he said, screw you. No, I'm not taking it out of stock. We're, this is, you know, if people don't want to work here, that's fine. I respect it. But this is our job. You know, we, we sell books. It is important when you sell books to be bought into the whole enterprise. You can't just say, well, if you blow some stuff up, just tell me which books you want me to sell. That's not a world that you want to live in. And we live in a sort of version of that now which is, you know, you take South Park out of circulation. So they, South Park did a thing a long time ago where they had, uh, during the Muhammad cartoon things, where they had a representation of Muhammad. But here's the joke about it, was that nobody wanted to show it. So it was Muhammad in a bear suit. So it's actually <laughs> not, it just looks like a bear, right? And he's like, I'm Muhammad, right? They're they, fantastic. They yeah, do good. not um, have that on the uh, Comedy Central archives. And I think it's also on maybe... Uh, HBO Max or something now. I have to look. I think it might be HBO Max, but you can't find that. That's the one of the ones that like why? But, but because it's blasphemous to who? I'm not a fucking Muslim. I mean, even if I was, you know, religious, I'm not any religion that I was. I mean, why is that dictating your policy of what you show? Well, it offends some people. Well, everything offends some people. Where is the line that you draw? Well, the line that they draw is quite obvious. It's not about sensitivity. They knew nothing about the, the theology of Islam. They know about violence. They know about the fear of violence, which I understand. It's not, you, not everybody has to be a hero here. But when you are setting those precedents, and there's all these little ones here, there, and everywhere, they, they add up to something of, of a culture of both fear, which then kind of transmutes into the culture that we have now, which is a culture of quote unquote sensitivity, which is itself a manifestation of a culture of fear. And that's why I loved Christopher Hitchens' defense of Rushdie throughout the 90s. He described this in grandiose terms as a culture war for, for freedom. And this is one of the things that uh, my bosses, Greg Lukianoff and Robert Shibley, wrote in the Daily Beast immediately after Salman uh, was stabbed. It published that, that evening. Um, about the distinction between uh, speech and violence and how that is essentially our cultural distinction that allows for freedom to work, allows for democracy to work, allows for liberalism to work. It was, it was, it was Sigmund Freud who once said that civilization began the day man cast a word instead of a stone. And that's what, that's, that is what civilization means. It means we leave our guns at the door and we don't, as my colleague Sarah McLaughlin recently wrote we don't bring knives to a word fight um we solve our different we solve our differences uh through word fights um and when you do bring a knife to a word fight you shouldn't be you shouldn't win no you shouldn't i mean there should be people that disarm you pretty quickly and take that knife, knife out of your hand unfortunately we're allowing those people to win now and we're allowing them to win um because of fear that we're now smuggling through this kind of idea of offense. And I think Kenan Malik, who I've mentioned a few times, and I think he's, he's um, underrated. I mean, in the, U in the U S I mean, I think people know him more in the UK and you should check him out. I don't um, know him. I don't know. Very, him. very sensible, you know, calm, even keeled, wonderful kind of historian of the rest of the affair the, from Fatwa to Jihad. But what his, I think the the 
subtitle of that book is something, and, and I'm just quoting from memory here, is something like multiculturalism and its discontents or something like that. Because what he argues is that the where, where all of this gets screwed up these days is the fact that multiculturalism and the idea of multiculturalism, and unfortunately, that was a word which has a very clear meaning that then became very muddy. I mean, who could object to multiculturalism? I mean, I love living in America because of the, you know, just this kind of car crash of cultures, which are brilliant and what makes this country so great. But the ideology of it is obviously something quite different. And his argument is that in you know, in this battle for Rushdie and many uh, in the satanic verses and many years after that, the shift became about freedom of speech and one towards multicultural society. And the multicultural idea says, you know, we have to live in this society together and we can't upset the people who don't kind of, you know, have the ideas of the dominant culture. And that's not something that that, that is sustainable. And, and that's that's just a bullshit understanding of multi multiculturalism. It too. absolutely is. I yeah, mean, yeah, it, yeah, multiculturalism yeah. is understanding that people have different points of view on things and letting them have different points of yes, view. Yes, absolutely. You within your private life can believe whatever you want about the Prophet Muhammad, and so can Salman Rushdie, right? That yes. is what multiculturalism is. That is what it means to live in a pluralistic society where people think different things. Uh, yeah. You cease to live in a multicultural society when you say that one culture gets to dictate by violence. Yes. Yeah what other people must believe and how other people must act and what art other people can create. And this is, I think, one of the things that really infuriates me about the debate surrounding free speech is that you have the acts of violence. You have firebombs at Berkeley when my Indianapolis is set to speak. You have Charles Murray attacked at Middlebury. You have Salman Rushdie stabbed in the neck when he's about to give a speech in New York State. But you also have a Frederick Bastiat problem, right? You have the seen and the unseen. Most people aren't seeing all of the books that aren't getting written because writers know that they can't get them through the sensitivity readers. It's a very good point. At, yeah. You, yeah. You, don't, you don't see all the jokes that aren't getting told because they know that, you know, if Andrew Schultz, for example, wants to tell a joke about abortion, the streaming provider isn't gonna, isn't gonna do it. So you have a cowardice on the part of the publishers who depend for, on the existence of the First Amendment to do what they do. Um, and they do have the First Amendment right to decide what they want and what they don't want to publish. And w we made the argument that, yes, you have that First Amendment right, and this is in the context of First Avenue, which is like Pierce's, oh, yeah, uh, Prince's go-to yeah. in Minneapolis. Yeah, when they, yeah. When they how, yeah when they, how I know it is from Prince, yeah. Yeah, you know, a big proponent of artistic freedom. I think the the parents re uh, music resource center started after tipper gore listened to a prince album or says she listens to a prince yeah, album yeah darling nikki i think was the yeah. song yeah but yeah, they 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 they're they're having a dave Chappelle um stand up event and then the day it's scheduled to happen because there's some protests over his jokes they cancel it and yeah, they have the first of Amendment like 20 right. people by the way that was the yeah it's yeah. and they cancel it and we took flack because we said they have the right to do it, but is this a net positive for free expression in America and for artistic freedom that this venue claims to uphold? The, the answer is no. And I think that's the direction that we're headed. And we're going to end up having an emperor has no clothes problem, right? There was, I just looked this morning, uh, organization populist Axios wrote this up about the differences between public and private opinions in the United States of America. It's amazing. Yeah. CEOs should take a stand on controversial social issues. 28% of people publicly agree with that. 14 privately agree. Public schools focus too much on racism in the United States. 43% publicly agree with that. 33% privately agree with that. Mask wearing was effective to stop COVID-19. 59% publicly agree with that. 47% privately agree with that. We're having an emperor who has no clothes problem because the gatekeepers are only letting certain opinions out. And it's their right if to you, do that. That's it's their exactly right, right to do yeah. that. But yeah. what they are doing is they are creating silent polarization in America and skewing in an artificial way what act Americans actually believe, what opinions Americans actually want to engage with. And uh, as a result, you get, uh, you get extreme politics. Uh, it's an enormous version of the Bradley effect, right? I mean, what people say publicly and privately. I mean, if you want to you know, not um, 
you know, if you're not a pollster and don't have the money to, to, to um, uh, create a poll or pay somebody to do so, uh, just come to the fifth column. Right. I'll tell you a lot about this because what they do, what we get is enormous numbers of emails, private messages. We have defaulted for a long time because we do, we read a lot of listener mail on the uh, paid, on the um, subscriber version. And we never, ever, ever, uh, ever uh, mention somebody's last name. Why? I mean, it's crazy. Like you would never default if you're the editor of, you know, even Playboy magazine in the 60s when it was considered like, oh, you bought Playboy. You'd never take the person's last name and their, you know, like, you know, Joe Schmo, Alexandria, Virginia or something that you wouldn't do that. We do it by default because so many people... I mean, it's it's funny that somebody did like a poll on like their you know their subreddit or something with the fifth column, and it was like, what is your political ideology? And the majority were left or center, which is hilarious because people would think that that's not the case. And you know, the number of people that that send emails that are like literally Hollywood people, news people. I mean, like substantial numbers of people that you would have heard of who are musicians. Um, I had one this morning I, with Blear. I have to actually look at it again. Who's a professional golfer? no joke a pga person and like, like oh, i love the podcast and like you know don't mention my name if you read this we get that all the time faculty it's members like, who want to stand up for the other faculty member but don't want to compromise their career I, business owner. Yeah, yeah especially in faculties i mean the number of people who say like oh i'm getting you know every time we have this is the tyranny of, of silence that fleming yeah, Rhodes talked yes, about this is exactly. what's happening i mean the number of times that that we've had somebody on who's a professor going through through uh, some kind of crap on campus, I say, are people supporting you? And say, well, they privately do. Or they send me something or somebody gets canceled for, you know, whether it's like Mike Pesca or something from Slate, brilliant guy. Um, I think we asked him that. He's like, oh, yeah, people send me messages uh, privately. They don't say so publicly. And I'm sure we- all these people that have had these, these problems in the past. But I think one of the things that I always find really interesting, and think about this for a second when you talk about Salman Rushdie and, and um, Satanic Verses, and of the things that one can and cannot say, um, we don't want to live in a society where there are special carve outs for, you know, ideologies, religions, um, you know, national background, whatever it might be, sexuality, any identity. We don't want special carve outs. We want to, I want to live in a society where everything is sort of equal in the sense that we can make fun of them, we can criticize them, but we are prepared to deal with the backlash. And the backlash, of course, should not be that you're no longer employable, so that sort of thing. So I always said this, this funny thing is that I you know, grew up in the Northeast. I am not a religious person. Um, never was a religious person. You know, I mean, Hitchens was, was a hero of mine before he became a friend of mine. And one part of that was like, we never talked about religion, but that was a, that was a thing that, you know, was never an issue for me because he's like the, the sort of devil for all of these people. Who <laughs> he's one of the four in. horsemen, right? Yeah. The four horsemen, uh, you know, Daniel Dennett and these guys. So I would always go and be in public places, be in dinner parties, whatever. And you can do this, this is a test. This is a very easy test. Try this in Manhattan now. And you would say, fucking, you know what I hate about Catholics? And you know, what? the Catholic church is so fucking stupid. And, and Christianity and these wild, stupid ideas that, that Christians hold and people nod their heads furiously because that's the sort of bien pensant opinion. Try, do that with, with Islam. Just try it at a party. I, I would just, I would love to see what happens. If you say, you know what I don't like about Islam? You know what Muslims believe? They're so fucking stupid. Like, I, do I believe this myself? It's not real. I don't really have opinions about that because I'm not. I'm not a sort of religion scholar. I don't follow the ins and outs of of Islam. I haven't read the Quran. Um, I don't know the hadiths. So it's not something I would say. But if I were to say it, it would be met with just absolute stunned silence. And it's like, well, no, it's a series of beliefs. I'm not talking about people. Ask it about Christianity at a, at a dinner party, though, and, you, and especially in New York, you'd you'd probably get a lot of responses, right? Here's the, here's the problems I have. Oh, I think I've been getting a lot of responses of people agreeing, of people saying, yeah, no. I mean, because what they do is they associate it with you know people who vote for Donald Trump, people who live yeah, in yeah, Mississippi, of that kind of stuff. And they're like, those are our enemies. They're our enemies. But if you're going to have that simple, simple view, and I disagree with that too, by the way. I don't think it's, I don't think it's a wise thing. And I think that it's, it's always important to remember that there was a very narrow focus on Rushdie in places like Bradford in the UK and then Pakistan, Indian subcontinent. But Muslims across the world, most of them couldn't have given a shit. They had bigger problems than Salman Rushdie's novel. Um, but you know, that is the thing. Like, I don't, I don't think that people should treat Christianity that way because it's a much more complex and, and interesting a group of ideas. The same thing, I think the same thing is true about Islam, but I think that there's a, 
there's all of a sudden, I remember having that first feeling when the Nation magazine after 9-11, probably about five or six years, when I read something defending um, Islam and just his ideas of Islam, people misunderstand Islam. And I just never thought I would see in like a, the kind of left-wing magazine in America, a defense of religion, a defense of, you know, a, a bunch of religious ideas, which was, you know, now because to Kanan Malik's uh, ideas that, you know, multiculturalism and religion had been kind of commingled. And that these are people who are the victims of oppression, they're non-white, et cetera. So then we have to look at these in a to with a totally different lens, which I disagree with. I just don't, I don't think that's right. I think that the religious views that Salman challenges and, you know, the satanic verses was a thing. You know, people can consider it blasphemous. And if you look at the, the, the you know, and, and also, you know, Muhammad, Muhammad's wives, which is part of uh, Salman's book and the kind of bordello of of these uh, these women who are Muhammad's wives and names are changed. Muhammad's name is changed to Mahud, I think. But um, all this stuff, is, they're, they're just ideas. They're sort of religious ideas that are debatable. There are people, you know, I mean, Salman was somebody who was saying that like, you know, we can debate the existence and, you know, of Muhammad or Muhammad's ideas or whatever it might be. What is wrong with that? Especially in the West, in a pluralist, actual multicultural society that should be allowed I, I it's it's baffling that people in our own world would think otherwise yeah i mean it's the first question right how did we get here yeah and yeah exactly and religion and that's, seeks that's to answer that, that. We, yes yeah and so uh the the fact that we wouldn't be able to have that debate of how we got here uh is is worrying well michael i've kept you longer than i promised i would keep you so oh no it's fun i love talking about this stuff yeah and I, I mean i absolutely you know love fire and if i sometime you know stumble upon a huge pile of money i'll probably give half of it to fire because no one does a better job and then the other half i'd give to myself because i'm a <laughs> selfish selfish person <laughs> so. you're, you're not getting a huge pile of money from all those patreon <laughs> subscribers there michael <laughs> well, well at the end of the day when you have to split it with two other bozos and then pay all the bills and keep the keep the lights on we, we, we desperately want more. Well, you're so, not on Patreon, right? You're on Substack right now, right? No, we're on Substack. The very good, I mean, and you know, it's funny on, on the free speech thing. We had not had a problem with Patreon, um, but we had a problem with listeners in the sense that we had a number of people that said, we refuse to subscribe because of Patreon, because Patreon has kept, kicked a lot of people off the platform for having views that they didn't like. And, you know, the probably views that I don't like either, but it doesn't matter to me. And um, the people over at Substack, um, Hamish, the guy who's the CEO and the founder of Substack, one of the two, I think, founders of Substack, was himself a journalist. Um, I think he wrote a book on Elon Musk, a uh, really great, smart guy, and a real principled defender of speech. And, a real, and, and, the, and the thing that we'll post, I think, in the next day or so, and this, you know, was we talked to Hamish, and I said, you know, people have this misunderstanding of, of Substack as being like sort of right-leaning. And my argument to him was like, look, and I know that they're not. I mean, good Lord. I mean, Salman has a has a Substack, a very successful We, we had uh, Lulu there. I think she's leaving as their VP of comms. She was our last guest on this podcast. We talked. Oh, about great. Yeah. Today. I mean, they're, they're, they, do, they do everything. And, and I said to, this was at the Substack headquarters, but my assumption was that, uh, you know, it changes over time. But at the moment, the people kind of that are nominally on the right or are getting a harder time. Um, finding platforms, especially in the wake of Donald Trump and, and you know, weirdos that, you know, <laughs> that uh, I don't have a lot of overlap with. But, you know, th that it, and when they come to Substack and have success there, I think it makes people think that Substack has a political orientation when it absolutely does not. But um, no, what they're not doing is there's as it's, as the sensitivity readers of kicking people off their platform. So you're getting a fuller sense of America and the very yeah. perspectives that exist in it. Right. Yeah. And we ask him on the show. And again, it's going to be published in the next day or so. You know, if there are limits, what are the lines? And he has a pretty interesting answer. And like, but the thing is, is that if you're within the in the bounds of, you know, ordinary speech and you're not inciting people or doxing people, I think is there actually a big thing. If you're going around like harassment, they don't want that in their platform. But um, but yeah, I mean, it's it's a it's a great place to be. They've been incredibly generous to us. And, um, you know, come on over and uh, join the fun. Can I can I admit that I'm not a Substack, Substack subscriber. And I, know, I, I, I do that. Here, here's the thing. This, <laughs> this comes down to my frustration with having to subscribe to so many different channels. Yes. No, you I, know, know. I love my Apple. I love my Amazon TV, right? Because you can yeah. have the apps for all of them and it's easily accessed. Yeah. And that's how I watch shows. Um, I use my Apple 
app to listen to podcasts. Now there yes. might be a way to want at, for Apple's app to determine how, if whether I'm a subscriber, you can tell me that or not. There is. There, there is. is. So I, I yes. wouldn't have to go through any extra effort to listen to your guys' podcast if I'm a subscriber. Besides no, subscribing, of you course. Wouldn't. There's just, you, we just give you, there's like a link that you copy. Um, but you know what? Because the, of the great work that you do and because of your generosity and having me on this podcast and being able to pontificate to your. If you're about your to give me a free subscription, I, I, am, I, will. I am literally, you can see me on my computer <laughs> and I'm going to give you a free subscription right now. So well, I appreciate, at well, I appreciate the end that. of this podcast, you will have, and if you do not, <laughs> and if you do not know, how to uh, figure it out? Um, just tell me. Well, now you're guilting me into away. figuring it out, which I will. And I, I listen to pretty much every episode that you guys put out. I since I've had my, had my child, uh, I listen to far fewer podcasts, but yours is is one I spend a lot of time. Listening. Well, I'll tell you what. As as a father myself, um, you are you going to give him uh, a, my son a free subscription too? <laughs> no, he has to pay. Yeah. Uh, come on, this isn't. I mean, this isn't a charity. He's Let's one go. years old. He's a big fan. Uh, you you now have a, a, a subscription to the column. It's be in your inbox right now. Um, uh, so, listeners, all you need to do to get a free subscription to the Fifth Column Podcast <laughs> is invite Harris. Michael onto your yeah. podcast. That's we always make fun of Sam Harris because he's like, if you have, if you can't afford this, just send me an email. And I'm like, man, if you send me an email, I'm blocking you. <laughs> you, you, you but you've you've given so much uh, uh, to us, and uh, you know, and Camille now is on your board, so. So we're all in the same family. So you're, you're, you're allowed a freebie. Well, there we go, Michael. Well, so. <laughs> I'll let you go because I think I got another meeting here in 60 minutes. I'm sure you've got plenty to go on, uh, including taking care of, it sounds like your landscapers who are. Uh, uh, no, they're <laughs> digging an enormous hole in the back of my yard. I have to go see if they've, if they've you know, hit gold yet. So There you go. Um. <laughs> well, well, I appreciate you coming on. Let's try and do it again sometime soon. And uh, hopefully we don't have to have another one of these morbid conversations. Yes. Very soon. Happier next time. Yes, Thank sir. You, Nico. That's Michael Moynihan. He is a co-host of the Fifth Column podcast. He is also a correspondent with Vice News Tonight. This podcast is hosted and produced by me, Nico Perino, and edited by my colleague, Aaron Reese. You can learn more about So To Speak by subscribing to our YouTube channel, which is linked in the show notes. Uh, most of our podcasts, including this one, have a video component to them. We're also on Facebook at facebook.com slash so to speak podcast. We take email feedback at so to speak at the fire.org. And if you enjoyed this episode, please leave us a review wherever you listen to your podcasts. They help us attract new listeners to the show. And until next time, thanks again for listening. 